I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is space, the final frontier. Californian Victor Glover, the first African-American to have an extended stay on the International Space Station. We talk about his spacewalk, his conversation with Vice President Harris, his own political future, and what's next for space tourism then. The streets of the state are too damn dirty. We go one-on-one -on -one with California Governor Gavin Newsom on his plan to clean up the state and fight back against the recall. Plus, where do you see the future of work going in America? An exclusive with the Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, and Congressman Mark DeCano about the future of jobs. The issue is, starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. He literally flew like an eagle in space for over six months. And now he's reflecting on that journey in his first statewide interview. Welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. And this week, a show that takes us literally out of this world. Victor Glover has been back on Earth for two months after six months aboard the International Space Station. He became the first African-American to stay there for an extended period of time. And part of that time was walking in space. His life story is extraordinary. Glover is a proud California native. He grew up in Pomona in Ontario, studied at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and joins us now from NASA in Houston. Victor Glover, welcome to The Issue Is, and on behalf of all the people of California, we are so proud of you. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Alex, thank you. It is great to be here. Thank you very much. All right, so after six months on the International Space Station, you, you're now back on Earth, had a little bit of time to adjust. What's it like yes. being home? Oh, it's great. I tell you what, uh, being home is great. You know, uh, partly being able to share more in depth with my family about what it was like to be there. I've had some time to process. It's been really great these two months. And I also had the time to take a little vacation just to spend time with my family. And so that has been really great. Well, let's talk about how you became that man. Growing up here in California, Ontario, Pomona, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, big wrestler, football player, sports had a big influence on you, but so did your fifth yes. grade teacher when it comes to engineering. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Hargrove, you're talking about. The first person who told me that, that I could be an engineer and I, I tell you, you know, I've got three engineering degrees now, and, and, and a large part of that is due to Mr. Hargrove and that early belief. He planted a seed in me that, you know, I, it has grown into to a lot of this uh, part of my life. And so, you know, Southern California is really special because it has a lot of my most important aerospace memories. You know, I, I learned to fly the F-18 in San Diego. I got to go to test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base, mm. and I learned to fly the Dragon at SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne there. And so, like, Southern California to me is just such a special place. Oh, yeah, I was born there, too, you know? And so it's <laughs> been very special. And, you know, I think the biggest thing uh, that helped me to get here was having a family that loved and supported me. They tolerated my tinkering with all the toys and the lawnmower, taking them apart putting them back together and they let my curiosity go where it was going to go. They told me how important it was to get a good education. You got to do something that very few people in human history have ever gotten to do. You got to do a spacewalk. So real basic question, what's it like to do a spacewalk? <laughs> wow. Gosh, I, you know, think of the most Think of your most amazing dream about flying, right? I think we all have flying dreams. So think about that. And then also think about maybe your most like terrifying nightmare. <laughs> and it's got aspects, <laughs> it's got aspects of both, you know? NASA astronaut Victor Glover working to get that APFR installed on the Canada Arm 2. All the training in the world, all the simulations, there is nothing to prepare you for that very first moment you spend outside the mm. space station. And that's just something you have to do to experience it. And uh, it was it was breathtaking and and it was just such an amazing thing to experience. Uh, but once we got out the door, we had work to do. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't just, you know, float around taking in the view. I had to go grab this big box, go get on the robotic arm and get out there to work installing this antenna. And so it was also uh, a very busy time. And I'm glad there were moments where I got to just reflect and, and check out the view. 
but they were also very, very busy. You know, you, you made history as the, the first African-American to be on an extended trip to the International Space Station. And at one point, Kamala Harris, the country's first African-American <laughs> female vice president, called you in space and acknowledged that history-making moment. Victor, it is so good to see you. The history-making that you are doing, we are so proud of you. What did that mean to you to have these two history-making figures being able to talk from so many miles away um, and, and be really a, a model to young boys, young girls, like your own kids? You know, I think that, first of all, that beautiful you know, example for young kids, I, that never gets old to me. You know, I, I, I think I can summarize kind of the, the feeling. It was such a great event. And, you know, I felt like the whole time I wanted to just go, you're in the White House, you know, and I felt like <laughs> Vice President Harris wanted to say, you're in space, you know, and that's just how the whole thing felt. I think both of us really had an appreciation for what the other was doing, you know, and she said something that I parroted in, in that uh, in that interview that, you know, being the first is good, but it's important to make sure that you're not the last. And I think we both said something like that during that event as well. And that's something that her mother said to her multiple times throughout her life. Uh, so Kamala Harris yeah. used to be the senator from California. We've seen a lot of NASA astronauts become senators. You got Mark Kelly from Arizona, John Glenn, of course, yeah. famously from Ohio. Any chance we might see Senator Victor Glover from California? <laughs> you know, <laughs> great question. I, I tell you, it's not, it's not in my short term plan. I, I love public service. I've been in the Navy 23 years now at NASA 8, and I, I have loved every moment of it, and, and I would love to continue to serve the public. And if that becomes the way that, that we, my family and I, think we could make do the most good, then I, I would consider it, you know. But I would say right now it's not on my, in my top uh, list of things to do just because the, uh, the folks I've listened to talk about campaigning and what that's like. It sounds pretty grueling, and I, you know, if someone wants to appoint me to something, hey, again, I love public service, and I'll put my best foot forward, but uh, I would love to avoid the campaigning if I could. In the political <laughs> world, he just did not say no, which means it's probably a yes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, what is the, the long-term plans? Is it is it the moon? Is it Mars? Any interest in either of those? Well, I mean, the long-term plan, you know, is to watch my kids grow up and, ch and chase their dreams. And, um, but you know, career wise, uh, we're starting this Artemis program and we've got a lot of exciting things coming on the horizon. Uh, and if the future involves another mission, then hey, I'll wait until NASA brings that up, but I'm not chomping at the bit to talk about leaving home again just yet. I'm happy to be right here with my feet on the ground. <laughs> Another, a couple other quick questions before we wrap up. We sort of see this battle of the billionaires right now, right? You got Elon Musk, yeah. Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, all have their own space companies in different ways. Space tourism, uh, but gonna become a thing within the next year. What do you make yeah. of that? And, and where do you see the future of space travel? You know, and this, the inspiration that comes from human spaceflight it's not this soft, fuzzy thing that's just purely emotional. It turns into, you know, industrial activity, academic activity. It, it affects the economy and our society. So, like, that inspiration is a real tangible thing. You know, these billionaires may be leading the charge, but it's to get more regular people in space. Mm -hmm. They want to see, like, like the airline industry uh, in its early days, it's going to go from this thing that is a little bit economically prohibitive to something that people can see themselves doing. And it makes us put our best foot forward in everything, science, medical, uh, in, in everything that we do. As a little kid that was obsessed with Star Trek and still is, I, I, sign me up for whatever trip in whatever way. <laughs> I love All the, right, the final let's do frontier. It. Let's do it. Uh, quickly, <laughs> we play a game called Personal Issues on our show. This is where we put 30 seconds up on the clock. We get to know you with some of your pop culture favorites and other things, uh, you know, okay. b b beyond just the space stuff. So here we go. I don't know how up to date you are and everything after spending six months in space, but here we go. Here we go. Ready? Uh, what's your favorite Ready. TV show? I watched uh, The Expanse in space, if that counts. Favorite movie? Okay, a new one, so Tenet. I watched Tenet in space, and Ooh. I really enjoy that. <laughs> That's a great movie. Uh, favorite athlete? Marcus Talon. Favorite sports team? You know, Team USA. I love the Olympics. <laughs> I really answer. like the Raiders, but I love the Olympics. Favorite team book? Team USA. Favorite book? 
I read the Bible frequently, probably the one thing I read the most, but I also was really impacted by Richard Hofstetter's paranoid style of American politics. Really, like super impactful. Meal you miss the most in space? Fresh greens, salad, just fresh vegetables in, in general. And have you had in and out yet since you've come back? <laughs> Not yet. I got to get to a, a play. We don't have one down here. I know. Isn't I know. that tragic? Yeah, that is tragic. Uh, and who's finally, who's your role model? My mother and my father, my stepmother, my grandparents. Like I said, it is not lost on me what, what they did, the sacrifices they made to, to support me. And so they are all collectively my role models and who I try to emulate. And lastly, what do you want the children of America to learn from your story? Oh, this was not preordained. This was not my fate. I worked really hard and had a lot of people who worked really hard with me and for me, who believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. And, and, and we together have made this, uh, this happen. It's really important to understand the process and not just the end product, um, to know that the struggle is worth it. It's, it's important to work hard and there's a reason to the working hard. Well, Victor Glover, I think the word hero is overused, um, but you are a genuine American hero, and it is an honor to speak with you. Thank you for inspiring me and inspiring so many of the people of California with your life story and your work, and uh, what a, a great privilege to talk with you. Alex, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for the kind words and the time. Up next, the Secretary of Labor in California to meet with members of Congress and talk about the future of work. But we go to break with Spaceman from The Killers and images of our favorite spaceman, Victor Glover. This week, the Secretary of Labor attending several events throughout California, pushing the president's agenda when it comes to the economy. Now, before being a cabinet member, Marty Walsh was a longtime mayor of Boston and a labor union leader. We caught up with him in Riverside, along with the congressman from that area, Democrat Mark Takano. Here's our exclusive interview. Secretary Walsh, Congressman Takano, welcome to The Issue Is. Nice to have you on for the first time. Nice to have you in California, a Boston guy, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to be on your show for the first time. And uh, excited to see, uh, you know, what Mookie Betts did, taking the World Series away from Boston and bringing it to L.A. <laughs> Still have to think about that. Could happen again this year, as uh, President Biden just said. We could see the Dodgers back. Kamala, I, I think we may be doing this again by the end of the year. <laughs> uh, uh, let's talk about the, the infrastructure plan. Right now, uh, there's the bipartisan proposal. Some moderates in the Senate uh, are in favor of it. Some on the left, some on the right are not. Where are we at in terms of it actually getting passed? Well, it, it's still moving forward. It, it's a great investment. It's a, it's a, it's a $1.2 trillion investment in our, in our physical infrastructure in this country. And, and it still has a ways to go to work, to work through uh, both branches. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I, you know, I feel good about where we are with the bill. Uh, and, and I also feel good on the other track with the CARES economy, moving that forward as well. So, uh, you know, the way the art of, of legislating is compromised, and that's what the president did. But he was able to bring a group of senators together, Republicans and Democrats, for the first time in a long time to be able to accomplish something incredible. Are you comfortable that that's going to pass? Uh I'm very optimistic at this point, uh, but the speaker's made it clear that she wants to see that bill as well as a much more expansive uh, reconciliation uh, bill, which would include more money for the care economy right. uh, involved in it. And, and part of the, that, something that's already passed was the coronavirus relief bill. Uh, we saw the stimulus checks that came with that, but a big thing that's about to start July 15th is the expansion of the child tax credit. Uh, payments being made in advance to people as much as $3,600 per kid. That's making a real impact in places like Riverside. A huge impact. I can't emphasize how big this is for the 41st district. 190,000 children and their families will be beneficiaries of this child tax credit. Um, we think we've estimated about $3,200 on average, on average. Some families will get more, uh, but this will be a huge boon to fill a huge need in the area as we're trying to lift ourselves out of this pandemic. And that's something that starts with direct deposits 
next week. Yes, this, this is automatically going to come from the government. They can always contact my office if they don't see it, and we'll troubleshoot. We'll figure it out. Uh, you know, the number one issue for so many people is jobs. Coming out of the pandemic, job situation here in California looks pretty good, but there are a lot of people that have been left behind. But big picture, long term, where do you see the future of work going in America? It really is about investment in workforce development and apprenticeship programs, uh, job training. When you think about places like California that have uh, emerging technologies, high tech, biotech, uh, just like uh, my home state and other places across the country, there's a real opportunity for us to train young people into those into those skills. And Congressman, you are the uh, chairman of the Veteran Affairs Committee. And when it talks about work, we think about veterans who are struggling. We see some of them homeless on the streets of California. What can be done specifically? to help veterans when it comes to employment? Uh, under the American Rescue Plan, uh, we move forward money for rapid retraining of veterans. There's a special fund to rapidly retrain our veterans specifically uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, and there's more we can do. Uh, and uh, But these, this is immediately on the horizon. President Biden has requested also uh, $18 billion. I hope to add another $3 billion on top of that uh, to upgrade our uh, medical health centers for veterans across the country. American people support that by a huge, huge margin. It's one of the most popular parts of the president's package. And, and just lastly, paint a picture for us, because we hear about work and automation and computerization and changes that are coming. Where do you see the workforce 10 years from now, 15 years from now, what does work in America look like? Well, I think it's really important that we pass these two infrastructure bills uh, because it is laying down a foundation for the future of the workforce in America. And, and I think without them, uh, it's very hard to paint a rosy picture. I think with these two packages, the CARES Economy Bill Back Better, the Infrastructure Bipartisan Bill, uh, we really have a, a great opportunity to continue to lead the world in technology and innovation and create an opportunity for everyone to access those jobs. So the future, to me, looks like uh, elder care uh, and the people who do elder care, the people who do uh, child care, not even, not even talking about early child educators, that they are respected and paid uh, for the great work that they do. Uh, and in the short term, it is one of the things that's holding us back. Even people who can pay full freight for childcare, they can't find slots in child care centers because they don't exist. We have to build that infrastructure, and that's why it's so necessary uh, to pass the American Families Plan alongside uh, the $1.2 trillion uh, infrastructure bill. And, and, and just lastly, as a Boston guy, what do you, what do you make of California? How's, how's this day going? What do you think of our area? I mean, the day's great. I've been to California before, but it's been it's been great today. You know, I'm getting a lot of razzing about the Dodgers uh, today. Uh, no one seems to talk about the uh, the Rams, so I, which is fine. They're not talking about the Rams, but they talk about the Dodgers. So uh, I just have to take it. Yeah, I have to take it right you now. You got to take him for an In-N-Out burger before he leaves. <laughs> right. In-N-Out for sure. Congressman Takano, Secretary, thank you so much, you. and go Dodgers. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. Still to come, California Governor Gavin Newsom says California is rising after a pandemic and we now have the funds to clean up the state. His critics say, too little, too late. We talk with both next. The era of corruption is over. Republican Assemblyman Kevin Kiley on ABC in Sacramento this week talking about his decision to run for governor. He's one of the governor's most vocal critics. Challengers must decide by next week in order to qualify for the ballot. As for the governor himself, he's largely ignoring questions about the recall and trying to focus on doing his job, including cleaning up the state. California Governor Gavin Newsom and L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti pick up trash near downtown L.A. The streets of the state are too damn dirty. California recently allocated $1.1 billion in state funds to clean up California. The governor says it will create 11,000 jobs. There's nothing bad about this program. More jobs, cleaner highways, less homelessness, less crime. On this day, the governor doing similar cleanups in the Bay Area and in Fresno. He first pitched the idea back in May when we talked with him exclusively. We're back with him again for this. We mean business. This is not a photo op. This is not a press conference. We were out here a number of months ago. Uh, you're with us. Um, we're coming back, and we're going to come back again and again and again and again. How do you, though, make it last 
permanently. You gotta keep coming back. The governor says California needs to deal with the key underlying issue causing this, homelessness. The state recently allocating a record $12 billion on that front. I think the difference between now and in the years past is we have money for an alternative. When you're actually out here and you see it as compared to being in Sacramento in some office and you see what these streets look like, what goes through your mind? I mean, it, I said this when we were together a few months ago when we initiated this. You see people's stories, their lives. That expression isn't what they left behind. And it may be tragic. It may be needles. Uh, but also maybe diapers. For me, there's no substitute to have an academic briefing in Sacramento in your desk versus actually going out. And I've done dozens of these all over the state. We're going to come back over and over and over again until we see measurable results on the streets. When we come back, 75 years ago, Jimmy Carter asked Rosalind to marry him. All these years later, what's their secret to a lasting marriage? I think I want to marry Next week, an exclusive sit down with the U.S. Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, on schools coming back after the pandemic. But we end this week with a presidential love story. This week, the Carters became the first presidential couple to celebrate their 75th anniversary. On PBS, Judy Woodruff asked them, what's their secret? We give each other space and we try to do things together. We're always looking for things we can do together. At the end of the day, we try to become reconciled and overcome all the differences that arose during the day. Uh, we also uh, make up and give each other a kiss before we go to sleep. And every day with a kiss. Thanks for watching this week. And to the Carters, happy anniversary, lovebirds.